Um, so, again, thank you very much for the introduction, Elena. It, it, it's a massive honor to be here. Uh, as I said yesterday, uh, I am quite excited about this initiative, mainly because I do believe it is probably the most important initiative that is currently taking place in the AI ecosystem, because the people in this room are the ones that are going to be really creating and building the future of artificial intelligence. Yeah. Like, you guys are going to be creating the systems that are going to be running our infrastructure in the next few years. So trains, lifts, I don't know, cars, all of those things, you know, will be actually uh, a lot of it innovated and driven by the work that you guys do. Today I'm going to be focusing um, uh, as a continuation on the workshops that you've had in the last few days. Uh, I'm going to be tapping upon some of the ethical uh, implications of artificial intelligence but I'm gonna uh, touch upon them from a technical perspective, giving you guys a framework, uh, a practical framework on how you can you know, understand and, and, and challenge you, the moral grounds in which you're operating from the actual you know, programming perspective. And um, I think tomorrow you will have another workshop that will focus on a uh, even more higher level kind of like ethics perspective. Um, from, uh, in terms of my background, I am the head of uh, deployment engineering at a legal tech company, so I run a department of over 10 machine learning and DevOps engineers. So we're building systems that automate lawyers. So if anybody, anyone's parents here are lawyers, uh, I apologize. Um, but you know, to emphasize, you know, we're not just like replacing them, we are enhancing their current jobs. And I'm gonna talk, touch upon this. Uh, also, as Elena mentioned, I'm, I'm the chairman of the Institute for Ethical AI and Machine Learning, where we're focusing uh, mainly on the intersection between uh, policymakers, academics, and technology leaders. So we work on empowering these technology leaders to ensure that they build industry-ready, secure, reliable machine learning systems. Uh, and I'm going to mention a bit more about that. Uh, I'm also a fellow at, uh, at the RSA and advisor at Tintin AI. And today we're going to be going through a very quick uh, recap. You know, I'm very happy to hear that you know Kieran has been rocking it with you know the overview on all of the the, the sub uh, fields of AI, mainly on on machine learning and neural networks. Uh, then I'm going to tap on a bit of the risks. I'm going to be using the microphone in the computer because the audio doesn't work. So bear with me on that. Then I'm going to be talking a bit on ethics by design and by pledge on a practical framework that you guys can use. And then the next steps we're going to be hosting a workshop. Um, so yeah, let's jump right into it. So to start, a very, very quick recap. I'm just gonna rush through this because you guys already know. Mainly, as, as Kira mentioned, there's two main approaches to AI. Either you hard code the rules, uh, like what you would do in Excel, or you build the systems uh, that learn the rules from data. Uh, the AI that is the most popular uh, at the moment is machine learning, which is basically the latter. And what machine learning does is, if I give you an example, can the machine learn to be able to predict new answers? As an example, you know, if you want to train a machine to tell between squares and triangles, you would create what we call a feature space. You know, in this case, it's the area of the perimeter. You have the, the squares scattered in a space and, and the triangles in another. And ultimately, you want to try a division line, to, to find a division line that allows you then to understand, you know, where are the squares, where are the triangles. This is a classification exercise specifically. And when you have this line, this function, you would be able to like say, well, I have a new input. Is this a triangle or a square? It would be able to predict it because it falls in the area where you predicted it was a, tri a, a triangle. So if we start with a blank brain and a bunch of data, you know, instead of hard coding the rules, you would be able to just take some examples and start get giving a machine an a, a, a set of squares and triangles. It would try to guess a line. You know, that's not very accurate. You give it more data, more examples, it would try to guess another line. Uh, more examples, we'll try to guess another one, and it would do so again and again, trying to minimize what you know Kieran has referred as well as the lo as the as the loss function, um, and you know this is ultimately trying to you know maximize in this case the distance between both shapes, um, and ultimately this is done with kind of like, you know very very simple maths. Um, when it finishes, you get the weights, what we call the weights, which actually you know represent the line where the line is. Um, and once we have that, you know, we basically have a function that allows you to predict. Um, you know, coincidentally, this linear function is the same function, you know, as the perception uh, algorithm, the neuron, the neuron in the neural networks that you guys just covered. Um, and you know, instead of just having one neuron and having a very simple straight line, you will want to have more flexibility. So you just stack several 
uh, neurons on top of each other to have more flexibility of the function. And then you stack several layers for flexibility on the learning. And all, most of the times, you won't want to predict things that are simple as squares and triangles. You would want to do more complex things. When you actually have more complex functions, you are able to do this with you know, more complex models. Um, you know, as it was mentioned yesterday, or probably today, this concept of deep neural network is uh, deep neural networks and deep learning has become popular because it uh, very recently, uh, from 2012, around those dates, it was possible to actually use a lot of data and very complex models um, to allow a machine to learn by itself. You know, so you could do very complex things, not just you know simple statistics, but you know predicting things like I mean this this same predicting cats and dogs, but um, you know, you would, you would do it with like classification and like images and etc. So now that we, uh, you know, I assume that you guys have an intuitive understanding from the last few workshops that you've had, um, what are the opportunities uh, with machine learning and AI? What are the risks? So ultimately, I mean, I'm just going to put the volume a bit higher so uh, I can put the microphone. Um, there are quite a lot of opportunities. You know, there's a lot of potential with these technologies in industries, whether it's you know, healthcare or manufacturing or advertisement. Um, you can do things like, you know, real-time optimization, predictive analytics, you know, strategic optimization to allow, you know, the C-level CEO or another of the kind of like very higher ops to make strategic decisions on all of their data in their organizations. You can do radical personalization. So, you know, I could basically, instead of put you in one of eight buckets as they used to do, I can actually be able to target specifically for what exactly you want. And you know, it gets to a point that you know, it even gets even more personalized as we're going to cover. Um, data analysis from real big data, now we're able to like, actually analyze very, very big um, data sets. Um, you can also all automate operational processes. You have like, bots, you have chatbots, all of these things, anomaly detection, etc., etc. And again, the sectors that this is possible to do is pretty much all of them, all the way from you know, the public sector to education um, to you know, construction, even these spaces. There are so many uh, spaces where this can be done. So let's have a look at the you know, opportunities that uh, these technologies have opened. Um, and some of the, of the most common ones is synthetic uh, phase generation. So if I can have a show of hands, who here has uh, come across this concept of uh, synthetic phase generation. Cool. So in this video over here, it is uh, a video that it took a video from Obama, and uh, it created uh, what is you know a fake video that moves in the same uh, way that your 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 face in a camera, and you know you're able to create this uh, fake kind of like scenes from very sim uh, very small amounts of footage. Um, so this is actually creating it from. You know, a very, very old video of Obama, which is actually not real, and this is from this guy that is just imitating it. Uh, when you uh, giving a speech, make sure you use uh, a lot of power. Which is, which is quite interesting, because this opens up the, the question of, you know, if you're actually opening your laptop, you, you, you have videos in YouTube, you have a lot of areas where you're sharing your, your you know, facial attributes. You now are able to actually, you know, take your facial attributes and put it in either somebody's face or, you know, make make kind of like, you know, your face move in a certain way. And this could also be quite useful when it comes to, like, for example, movie production, right? You would reduce the costs massively because, you know, you don't even need to hire actors anymore, <laughs> right? Um, but yeah, it's not it's not great for the actors. Uh, then there's another one, um, you know, the synthetic voice generation. Who here has come up uh, across synthetic voice generation? Awesome. So, I mean, you guys are probably all, all more aware than most people. I, I was giving a talk at the U.S. Embassy and, you know, they had literally no awareness of all of this. You know, that's why I, I think it's super important to bridge those gaps. But, yeah, so in this case, it's a startup called Lyrebird. This startup can take one minute of your voice and be able to, you know, create your sound from, like, this uh, kind of, like, uh, from, from, from this snippet. So, let, 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 let's have a, uh, a quick uh, listen to this. Have you heard about this new technology? Are you speaking about this new algorithm to copy voices? Yes, it is developed by a startup called Lyrebird. This is huge. They can make us say anything now, really anything. The good news is that they will offer the technology to anyone. This is huge. How does their technology work? Hey, guys, I think that they use people. So you, guys, you guys get the gist, right? So, I mean, can you guys guess who was in the... Video, in the, in the <laughs> yeah, that was Donald Trump. Who else? 
Obama on balls? Hillary, yes. So I mean, but but imagine like some some day like you just like I don't know, uh, pick up the phone and suddenly you know in the other line it's yourself, right? Wouldn't you be like a bit a bit confused? Uh, and this is you know where where Google comes in. Uh, have you guys seen the video of of their Google I/O? Another show of hands. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So this is basically uh, a video where they're actually setting up a bot to call. To schedule the appointment for you. Let's listen. So basically, it's just like uh, one of their assistants making a call. Hello, how can I help you? Hi, I'm calling to book a woman's haircut for a client. Um, I'm looking for something on May 3rd. Hello, can you hear me? Mm-hmm. Right. So I mean, like now, now, now it's starting to get weird, where it's like uh, mannerisms that are quite human. But putting it all together and also taking into account that you know there's already a, an entire business model for you know for the bot industry, you know it does open the possibilities for a lot of you know you know not just businesses but also uh, interesting use cases that wouldn't be used all for good, right? And this 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 starts kind of like you know putting into perspective you know why it's important to ensure you kind of like the ethical development of this of these things. Another point is that ultimately what we're developing here are actually classifiers. So they're just functions. They're, you know, silly maths. Nothing, nothing beyond that. And ultimately with these functions that you're actually um, trying to approximate, you know, you're trying to approximate the real function, they will have some flaws, right? In this case, you have a classifier that is trying to classify a uh, banana. And then when you put a toaster, you know, it's able to classify correctly a toaster. But if you're able to give the input into the model, um, that actually optimizes for the inputs of what would represent to be a toaster, it would actually trick the model that you've trained um, to think that it's something that it's not. And it actually becomes um, dangerous because it actually puts into perspective, you know, an, uh, what they call hallucination problem that is quite hard to fix because ultimately you're approximating a function with a lot of edge cases that only with testing you would be able to know whether it's uh, addressed or not. And one of the uh, examples that, that was put here is if you take a picture and you add an epsilon on the, on the pixels like that that was, that was done, it actually can trick the classifier, even though you don't notice it. So when you have a self-driving car, you can actually have, say for example, a stop sign that uh, is run through this kind of like epsilon um, for you to actually trick the machine learning algorithm within the car to think that it's something else. Uh, it can be an arrow, it can be whatever else. So I think it's important to make sure that you know, your systems are well tested to ensure that you know, it doesn't have this, this kind of like backdoor, uh, backdoors to, to them. And you know, if anyone said robots, I mean, there is kind of like a whole new industry that is coming in. Uh, that's a pretty good backflip right there. Um, but you know, there's a lot of really cool opportunities. And right now we're, we're, we're exploring like all of these things. And you know, ultimately, data is also more personalized. I mean, have you guys heard of this thing called um, 23 and, and Me? Yeah. Yeah. So basically, it's this service where you send a bit of like saliva, and then they're able to predict all of your ancestry. Um, but you know, going back to this radical personalization, like these guys actually tell you, you know, from your genes, how prompt you are to drink caffeine, or how prompt you are to, you know, get angry, right? So now, when you actually run these inputs through a classifier. You're not only, you know, putting yourself, put, putting the, the audience into, you know, eight buckets. You know, you're actually able to predict a person's perspective and, you know, desires to a very, very uh, minute uh, perspective. And that's something that we've seen, you know, with with the recent kind of like, you know, political um, instances, um, if, if 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 we refer, refer to them like that. Um, that that ultimately, you know, there there there, there has been uh, a lot of new innovations in the app tech space that people have used for, for the benefit. Um, and you know, ultimately, there is regulation that is trying to play catch up. Uh, GDPR, namely, have you guys heard of GDPR here? Does, uh, can somebody explain like in one line what GDPR is? Yes, just one line. New data protection. Yeah, I mean, pretty much, yeah. I mean, it's basically what you said is the general data protection uh, kind of like act, and ultimately it is to ensure that people's, when, when people's data is stored, you notify them. But for example, if you give consent, which is what they operate on, and this is something that uh, I was chatting with, with Elena, um, you know, if, if you give consent, for example, for people to store your videos, if they extract the emotions or the voice or your face from these videos, 
Does that still fit into the same consent? Are you guys okay with that happening? I mean, that, that opens up this, this question, which is basically not really covered by this, this, this new regulation with GDPR. And the implications, you know, actually uh, include a lot. It, you know, includes that, you know, large-scale automation of processes and people, which means that, you know, many people will be displaced uh, but also, you know, new generation of like cybersecurity uh, implications, uh, as you saw of like tricking classifiers, improvements in defense and attack systems, uh, danger of algor algorithmic bias uh, beyond just human traits. So ultimately, when you train a machine learning model, um, whether you want it or not, you know, it will be biased. You know, it will have to discriminate towards the right answer. But ultimately, how do you make sure that your training set? is actually a good representation of what it will see in real life. And we will see an example that, that, that you know, actually dives into this. Um, you know, danger of, of, of disasters due to lack of regulation or um, you know, staying behind in this AI race that is currently happening from a nation level. Uh, and then you know, increase of efficiency, re reduction of cost, et cetera, et cetera. And there's certainly some, some risk, but there's a lot of opportunity there. How can we ensure um, you know, the safe and responsible development of AI. Because there's so much potential, we just need to make sure that we do it the right way. And when we say we, I make sure everybody. And I think Elena has. So ultimately, I mean, the, the perspective that I have is that there's not a single right answer. And ultimately, regulation is, is catching up, as I said. And when you're in the field that you need to make decisions of, what should I create? What should I build? Which data should I use? Should I be storing this data? The only thing that you can use is your intuition, your moral grounds, your ethical frameworks, which all of this is quite uh, intuitive. You know, you don't really, you know, when you're at school and you're like, you know, I don't know, about to uh, jump on a test, you don't actually stop and go like, hey, what's my moral ground on this? You know, you don't, you don't actually think about it. Um, you know, you, you just act on it. And this is actually that is built uh, through, you know, all your years uh, in high school and middle school and elementary. Um, so I think it's more, it, it, to answer that question, it's, it's more important on what are the values that you build uh, throughout that then further in life allow you to make sure that you do the right calls. And are we good? Awesome. Right, so now we're going to jump into that, into that specific point. And I think, you know, it was a good question to open up on the point of, ethics uh, by design, and more specifically, uh, what are the practical perspectives that we can take, you know, even right now that you guys are going to be developing stuff potentially in the hackathon this weekend. Um, and, you know, ultimately, you know what, even our ethics, and why are they important? Why, why are we actually, like, taking our time to look at them? You know, ethics, ultimately, from, from you know, the definition perspective, you know, it's the moral principles that, that govern a person's behavior, or the conducting of an activity they're about to carry out. So it's, it's very, very abstract. Uh, it's questions of you know, you know, how to live a good life, and our rights and responsibilities, the language of right and wrong, moral decisions, you know, what is good, what is bad. Um, but ultimately, you know, this is diving into kind of like a very you know, philosophical you know, perspective of, of, of this. Um, you know, and we apply them unconsciously. This is what I was saying. You know, when, when you actually have to make a decision, you make a decision because you think it's the best decision. But what does that mean and where does that come from? That comes from your you know, internal kind of ethical frameworks that you've built in the past. For some people, doing something may, that may look bad for them, but for others, it may actually not be bad. You know, I guess questions like, you know, is cheating on a test bad? I mean, raise your hand if you think it's, it's bad. No? I guess, you know, it depends. I mean, you know, maybe there's a situation where, you know, it, it's, I don't know, life or death or something like that. Quick, like, there are some, some areas where, you know, it's, it's actually not a simple right and wrong. There's sometimes where it's a right and right. Uh, you know, when should you stick up for others? You know, should that always be the case? Well, probably, but are there some caveats? Is there a situation where lying isn't, isn't, isn't bad? Uh, should you tell someone, uh, tell on someone to help them? Um, and all of these things, you know, as I said, you know, you don't actually really think about them when uh, you implement them. And in, in, in the field of AI, it's literally a wild, wild west. Uh, <laughs> regulation is still not there, and there's not really an understanding of what it is. You know, outside of here, there's still discussions on how can we give AI ethics, and it's like asking how can you, you know, give I don't know a knife ethics or a fork ethics. I don't know. Like, ultimately, is how do you how can you give the person that creates it and that uses it that ethical framework? 
Uh, and with this new field, there's new surprises. And that's why you need to get ready from, from the fundamentals perspective as opposed to uh, anything else. And ultimately, from my, from my viewpoint, people can be in you know, four different areas. You know, they can be conscious of what they're doing, and they can be ethical. You know, they can be doing the right thing, whatever that means. And you know, in that case, it probably will, to a certain extent, go right. There's also the situation where somebody may be ethical, but unconscious. So they might actually screw up and something goes wrong. That's a, that's a possibility. There may be people that are conscious and unethical, right? So they're, they know they're doing the wrong thing, but they don't care. And then there's people that are unconscious and unethical. So, you know, we never you know, want to be in any of those three quadrants. We want to make sure that we try to stay as close, you know, to the, to the top left. And, you know, this is not a binary, right? It's more of like a spectrum. And this is a very subjective spectrum that we're trying to figure out and, and, and we're trying to make sure that, you know, as a society, we answer the right questions. And I, and I know that you guys did uh, one of these problems, you know, the, the, the dilemma of the autonomous systems. Imagine you're in a car between, uh, an autonomous car between another car and a motorbike, and some boxes start falling towards you. It's the question of what should you do, right? Should you just go straight and crash to the, in front? Should you go to the car or should you go to the motorbike, right? I mean... Uh, ultimately, if a human was making these decisions, the human, you know, it would be reactionary. It would be not really a cold plan decision that he made. But when it comes to autonomous systems, you get into the discussion of, did a programmer actually say that in this situation, it has to do that, right? You know, who is at fault? Is it, is it the people? Is it the programmer? Is it the fact that the, the, they didn't like review the, the data? You know, it opens up all of this, all of these discussion, discussions. And you know, as I said, when humans are driving, it's more of a reaction. Whereas when you know the, the autonomous uh, vehicle decides, you know, it could be a decision. It could be the programmer, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it, it becomes, a, a, becomes a, a very, very hard. So I want to take a step back from this philosophical dilemmas and actually go into an, a practical, more binary-like framework. Where, you know, in, in the software perspective, if you guys have built code, you are able to get into a position where there are some basics that you need to accomplish. You know, either the, te the code is tested or it's not. You know, of course, there's multiple levels of testing, but, you know, either you, you made sure that it's stress tested or not. Did you make sure that you considered multiple areas or not? And there are already certifications that allow you to do that. So, how can we address this fundamentally from a design perspective? And how can we make sure that our development for you guys is actually human-centered, it's industry-ready, and it's transparent? Um, is the question of how can you achieve these things as you develop systems? Even when you are in this, in this hackathon, you know, having this thing in the back of your mind. And you know, how can we address this? You, know, you guys know that programming is not as fun as you know, some people may think, <laughs> that they imagine you're just you know, with like, some VR screen shooting variables to monsters. In reality, is you know a bit more calm, and like this guy is is, is doing is, is more of a kind of like Stack Overflow flip, trying to understand you know why this obscure bug took place. So the the, the, the perspective of addressing it you know is not going to be as exciting as you may think. And you know what we're doing at the at the institute is a is a, is a rolled plan where the first step is you know ethics by commitment or by pledge, and then by process by certification and, and furthermore by regulation. But Right now, what I want to explore is phase number one, which is uh, ethics by pledge. Uh, this is, you know, the eight commitments that you know I currently have on the website that you can actually go in and, and, and pledge for that. And we're going to see it on a on a uh, on a use case, which is basically uh, an automated prediction for an insurance calculator. So if you want to get life insurance, um, you normally would have to get kind of like a, a background check and some people with. Tons of years of experience that are probably like 40 years or older than you guys would go into all these records and trying to make a decision of, of what number makes sense for you. But in this case, let's assume that we've created a system, a machine learning system, that you give it your profile and it basically predicts how much your you know, insurance should be. Um, and what are the kind of like implications that we should take into consideration? So let's see the eight implications. So to ensure augmentation, augmented as opposed to artificial. So when I talk about AI, you know, I try to push more towards augmented intelligence as opposed to artificial intelligence. You know, machines are dumb, you know, they're, they're silly. They're not the smartest things. And it's ultimately the people that make them uh, capable. 
What would be bad in this perspective is to just use predictions without checking. What would be better, and you know, see that I'm not saying good or perfect, what would be better is that you actually have a sign-off process for, with a human at the end. And that's what we always do. So in the insurance process, you, know, you put the predictions in front of a human and then they make the decision. The second one is you know, uh, awareness of uh, bias in data. And I guess this would be a gif of them discussing whether it's Android or Apple that is better. But um, this is basically you know, a naive perspective. It's just taking all the data and just training on all of it. And why is this bad? Because it can have a bias. You, know, you may have data that is collected that may have more data from man than woman. Or it may have more from uh, an ethical background than another. And it, the algorithm just learns. And it will become biased. So you need to take an understanding on this. And you know, what would be better is if you actually have a look at your entire data set and make sure that you pick an understandable uh, and, and a comprehensible set of inputs to train your model and that you run some, some comprehensive tests around it. Um, from the job displacement implications, you know, you're going to be optimizing a lot of the, of the processes. You know, if you just push unconsciously for automation, you know, it wouldn't be great. What would be better is if you understand and address the automation implications. For example, we're automating um, uh, you know, lawyers, but ultimately we realize that by decreasing the costs of you know, laws, legal services, the total demand for legal services increases, which means that more people will be using our tool to actually deliver these services. So you need to understand how you're going to rescale um, the individuals. And then in terms of um, accuracy, you know, what is bad is if you just take the naive, naive accuracy number, right? Like, you know, the, the total good ones versus the total bad ones. You know, what would be better is to understand the, the actual F1 score, different scoring metrics, what actually uh, reflects more into the practical, you know, human sign-off process, which, you know, in our case, we, we have multiple scoring metrics. In the case of insurance, you would want to have not just, you know, is it this number or this number, but more of like, you know, what is the cost of like somebody in this situation um, versus like this other person, etc., cetera, et cetera. Um, Awareness and plan for an audit trail. So, you know, the bad thing would be just like overriding your models, not really having uh, the stored uh, outputs, uh, how they relate with your data. And what would be better is actually to store your label data with a change log of your work so that you can actually understand who made what changes when why did something became away? Why was something predicted away? Da, 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 da. So I think that's, that's super important to, to have. Um, backwards compatibility and versioning to ensure that you know, all of your previous models you know, uh, won't be reused. That would be a very bad assumption. You, know, you need to make sure that the things that you deploy, and this is, this is basic software practices, right? Is you deploy a new API, you would expect people to actually you know, plug into that the API, and whenever you release a new version, I'm not realizing that putting GIFs is now, you know, driving all the attention to the GIF <laughs> as opposed to the, you know, ethical implications. You guys are going to be like, oh my god, what decision do I make? Oh, I can only think of Legos. Oh, no. <laughs> so let's, let's pay attention on this, <laughs> on this perspective. Um, so, so number seven, transparency on data meta data collection. So this is back to, you know, assuming all st stakeholders understand the data is the worst thing you can do. Better would be to provide comprehensible breakdowns on how you're planning not to just to store their data, but what metadata are you going to be using it for? You know, Facebook, when they pulled them into doing the hearing, they were like, oh, we, we don't sell your data, what you're talking about. And that's true. But ultimately, they sell services on top of your data. And, you know, are we cool with that? Mm, well, me, maybe, but, you know, we need to have a discussion about it instead of just, you know, pointing fingers. And the last one is, uh, you know, identifying um, uh, kind of like cybersecurity risks. And, you know, you want to make sure that you uh, are able to protect, protect from you know, cyber attacks. And we all know that cyber attacks look like that. Um, uh, in a bad situation is when you're like, oh, I'm doing machine learning. You know, what cybersecurity implications? But in reality, you saw that, you know, actually models are statistical uh, kind of like functions that you are able to trick. So you need to understand what is the testing that you can put behind it and what is the training that you can have to your staff so that they can avoid any social engineering uh, implications. And yeah, you've completed phase one. You guys are you know, professional um, experts in machine learning. You know, that's valid in any non-technical parties. Uh, you, know, you can put it on your link LinkedIn profile, uh, machine learning experts. You can collect your di diplomas after the, the talk. Uh, well, after the workshop, I guess, uh, the entire bootcamp. And yeah, so I guess so to jump up uh, into the, the, the workshop. So now what we're going to do is we're going to take a practical approach into this. Um, 
I'm going to break you guys into a teams of, well, probably a total of five teams. I think that'd be good. So I'm going to be giving you guys each a uh, number from one to five. And remember the number. That's the first test. Um, and then, you know, I'm going to make you guys split into teams. Uh, then you guys are going to have to pick a use case that I'm going to cover right now and then pick a pledge. So I'm going to show you how that's going to look like. So we have several use cases. So the, uh, we're probably going to need the paper uh, in a bit. Um, uh, the use cases are going to be um, self-driving cars. So what are going to be the, the implications? Um, they're going to be, uh, well, um, and, and the pledges, I'm going to go back into the use cases. The pledges are going to be the eight points that we covered. So you're going to choose which one you want to focus on of these eight. Uh, and you're going to try to apply it into whatever you choose from the left side. The use case is self-driving cars, basically an implication of how can you make sure that this, you know, algorithms that have taught the car to drive are, are, are you know, aligned to whatever pledge you choose. Emotion detection on ads, what are the implications that you need to take into consideration. Um, automatic court decision, prediction. So if you have a court case, uh, somebody's going to be uh, either guilty or not guilty. And there's going to be a machine learning model that automatically predicts this. What are the things that you need to take into consideration? Smart classrooms. Uh, you know, imagine you're in class. I don't know if you guys saw, but you know, China just released a new uh, camera that you know looks at you all the time and sees if you're paying attention, sees your emotions, whether you're annoyed with the teacher, whether you're happy. You know, <laughs> what are the implications of you guys building this system? You know, um, uh, cameras, cameras, crime detection and smart robot waitress. So again, what, what's gonna happen is you're gonna choose one of the, of, the, of the points in this side, and you're gonna choose one of the points in, in that side, and try to do an analysis on what are the points that you want to you know, think of. For example, you know, say I'm in one team, and I go like, I'm gonna pick um, you know, smart classrooms, and the perspective of um, you know, cyber security. My point would be, we need to make sure that uh, we can protect bad actors trying to break into the system and you know, fake some data that makes teachers think that all the children are, or all the, all the students are sad or annoyed. And then the teacher starts putting things into place which then derail the entire course because of just like a bad uh, number that was achieved because of somebody breaking into the system and modifying the data. So, if you pick one or maybe two of the pledges and one of the use cases, and then try to do an analysis and, and some of the points that you would want to make sure that you would take action on um, to implement it. Um, so before we jump into this, uh, I want to see if anyone has questions before we jump into this. So, any questions? Yes? Yes. <laughs> um, so I heard about this thing where um, there was like this AI that is being developed to possibly teach children. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering what you thought about that. Uh, yes. So. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, you guys can hear me anyways. So, so I think you know ultimately one of the points that I had made previously is that you know when it comes to automation of of, of work, you know as we currently automating a lot of the regulatory exercises that are not carried by lawyers, this will happen in other sectors. And these sectors include education. And there's a lot of operational processes that will be automated in education. And the processes and the admin work that will be automated most uh, will involve work that both the teachers and the parents do. Um, this ultimately will allow probably parents and teachers to focus on higher level tasks that are more important for, for, for the kids whilst other things happen. Specifically to the point of, you know, actual, you know, agents teaching kids directly. I don't think, you know, back to the points, you know, I think the augmented versus artificial. I think, you know, we should never have a pure, you know, automated agent interacting with humans without any kind of like actual human in the other side, doing at least a sign of process. Um, but I do think that there's a lot of the admin work that definitely should be automated by autonomous systems. Um, so I, th I think, you know, in that specific case, you know, you could actually have a look at that and take that and break it down. 
um, because it'll be quite interesting. What are the implications and what are the benefits? And how can you make sure that you follow uh, an ethical framework to make sure that it's as good as it can be? So I think it could be good, but if it's actually you know automated teachers and that's it, I would think it's not good. <laughs> Another question? And then we'll jump. Can I say something about that point? Um, yep. I don't think it would be a good idea because about the cyber security, if someone got in and started like changing the code and the robot like taught the kids like different stuff that's not the right thing, especially young kids, then uh, it will go wrong. So that's, that's a good point. So I, I think, I mean, um, I think, I think this discussion is actually segue into the workshop. I mean, the current objective is to have specifically those conversations. So what we are going to do now is I'm going to give you guys a number. Is it another point? Yeah. Perfect. 60. 60. 60. A human teacher would actually be better because there are many aspects that it's not just education and the way education is set up right now isn't even the most efficient to be. I, I agree, I agree. So I, th I, think, I think ultimately that's why it's important to have all of these you know, thinking processes of where can AI actually help and where can it augment the things that people can currently do. You know, teachers should be augmented, they shouldn't be replaced. You know, but it's how can you make sure that their impact is actually much bigger than it currently is, because it is super inefficient. Um, so, okay, so I'm gonna give you guys a number from one to six, so that you guys are uh, teams of six. So, please remember your numbers. So, one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five. Are you taking butt? Oh, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four. No. Okay. So okay. So if 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 ones go over here, twos over there, threes, four, five, sixes, and then um, also yeah, maybe we'll give the papers once you guys get together. So one's over here, two's over there, threes, fours, fives, sixes, one's over here. So guys, I'm going to put a timer, I'm going to put a timer of 10 minutes. But not yet, not yet. We'll still first uh, split this. Yes, Python. Six over here, five over there, over there, four, four over here. Where's four? Four. Four, four over here. Four, four, four. Awesome. So, okay, so uh, number one, raise your hand. Number two, is raise your hand. Number threes? Number fours? No more fours. Okay, fives? Sixes? Nice. Uh, I think there's another four. Oh, okay, there's another four over there. Okay, so guys, what I'm gonna do now, um, I'm gonna actually put a timer. I don't know if 10 minutes will be too much. Probably let's start with five, and if you guys think you need more time, then we'll add five more minutes. But So the objective is for you guys to actually have a discussion, pick one or two of the pledges with one use case, and Understand what are the actions that you're going to take so that you're going to address the pledges that you chose. So, okay, we're still pointing, okay, to her. So the people that are being pointed to, so you guys are going to be uh, the team leads. Uh, so you guys are going to be the ones presenting the points. Um, uh, you don't have to come to the front, just like, you know, give a brief. Um, so remember, it's quite simple. Um, 
you know, just mention what are the, the things that you chose. So very, very simple. You don't have to go and talk about, you know, where you were born and, you know, how uh, your favorite color is blue. You know, just make sure that you say what are the use cases you chose, the use case you chose, the pledge you chose, what are the opportunities you found, the risks, and the actions that you're going to take. So we're going to start with team number one over here. So. Okay, so uh, our use case we chose was uh, smart robot waiters. So we came across the risks that one risk is if you've got an allergy and the robot messes up somewhere, accidentally drops some peanuts in your food, that will kill you. Whose fault is it? And then, so that would link to the pledge of cybersecurity because if we got Donald Trump at our restaurant and someone sends that robot a little message to poison his food or something, what will happen with that? So, um, we thought the fact that if someone comes in and establishes that they've actually got an allergy, that a uh, human waiter would go and deal with that. So that would also link to the pledge of job automation. So that would prevent all the jobs in the restaurant just going to robots. So that would also have um, keep job opportunities for the people. And then like the positives of having smart robot waiters is that it could be multilingual. So if you come into a restaurant, you don't speak English, you can just say speak in another language and understand. You also have that robots don't need rest, so you're not going to have a lunch break. Everybody want to leave at the same time. Nobody working on holidays. Yeah. Awesome. Well, let's give them a round of applause. Amazing. Robot waiters. Okay, so now we go to one. Because it was started from zero. So <laughs> uh, so, so we chose smart robot waiters also because they're cool. Um, and yeah, so basically the issues that we came up with were essentially mostly about job automation and the risks that involve that are uh, that that entails like losing having jobs lost people being angry that, because you know jobs are good for people and in general as a rule um and um bias and discrimination actually because what if you have a smart robot waiter who chooses to serve some customers before they serve another customer and then the other customers get really annoyed because it's like why am I choosing me? Your training data is screwed up. It's so rude. Um, and yeah. What are the actions? The, 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 sorry? Oh, the actions that I'm going to take to sort to, to the we as a as a collective are going to take to solve those problems <laughs> together um, is we are going to um, ensure that the smart robot waiter will queue up um, every like like a stack kind of um, will stack up all its orders so that it doesn't go to the nearest customer it goes to the customer who ordered first and we're also going to sort the job automation thing by making sure that there are still people who need to help out the waiters, the robot waiters, not the people waiters, because there are none of them. Never mind. Uh, <laughs> nice. Okay, that's, 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 nice. Good. that's good enough. Yeah, round of applause. Come on, come on, come on. Come on, come on. Come on, come on. So, uh, our group picked smart classes, and uh, our pledges were bias and discrimination in cybersecurity. So, uh, potential for smart classrooms are like teachers can watch like the footage and find like the best learning environment for like a specific child or group, and then um, so they instead of focusing on uh, the children, they can focus on teaching. Uh, teachers and uh, the cons of this are um, like threat to children like if if someone was to hack in to it and start watching the children it would be a bit creepy and yeah and uh, also uh, attend like um, 
Yeah, and we want to fix this by having attention to keeping the system safe, like not a, uh, like it's not, uh, it can't be hacked, and yeah. Awesome. No, that's good. Perfect. Round of applause. Amazing. Nice. So a little testing. A little testing. That's good. So, nice. Hand it over to who in this team? To her? Nice. So we, are, um, we picked um, emotion detection ads. So um, our pledges were cyber security and accuracy understanding. Uh, so the risks that we found were that um, like the algorithm won't always be 100% accurate with the, uh, with the emotions. So like, um, for example, if, um, like if you have an ad, say for, um, like if they're targeting people who are happy and they um, give them content that's kind of sad, um, it will like kind of, um, like, I don't know, um, yeah, <laughs> um, so if you have someone hijack the, um, the ad, you can have, um, like, um, so like, you can have um, people, um, like, posting the wrong kind of content, so, for example, yeah. <laughs> Um, oh, yeah. um, the things that we think that we should do um, is we can have people, like actual people, moderate the content. Mm -hmm. So even if the ad is like generated by like automatically, it um, has to be like um, it has to have like regulations so that it can't be manipulated. And the opportunity that we found that. Um, if you um, target people with, uh, like, based on their emotions, so um, if you can make someone feel sad about an ad, you can kind of manipulate them into actually buying the product, which is like could be useful even though it's kind of bad. <laughs> um, and it helps with the study of psychology with the data that you gain from it. Awesome. Yes. Round of applause. Yeah, actually, uh, manual sign-off on the ads is actually a huge market right now. Like, like Facebook, for example, is hiring hundreds, if not thousands, of, of people in their market strategy departments to literally just go like post by post, saying yes, okay, or bad. You know, so it's 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 a good good point you mentioned that. And then the last team. So who in the last team is going to speak? Nice. Cool. Okay. Um, so we did the the uh, automatic call prediction. So it will this the the automatic call prediction should remove racial bias in in the judges, which could be a good thing, like especially in countries like America where racism is still quite high. Um, the uh, another uh, problem. Uh, sorry, some more good things. It speed up. It will speed up the cases as it doesn't take quite so long to decide. And also, it will. It will sorry, it will standardise sentences. At the, um, so everyone who everyone who gets the same crime will get the same sentence. Um, uh, some problems with it: the data we give the AI, the AI could be biased, so therefore the it could still be racist. Um, Sometimes it, it might not be able to understand why the offence was committed, so sort of motives behind it, which could affect what sentence it, it, it should have given. And also, if it got hacked, um, it could severely affect court cases. Um, so action we would take, we, uh, we'd make sure the data isn't biased, and um, we should we probably wouldn't re replace the judge so much as replace the jury, so that we still have um, a human overruling everything. We just have an AI sort of, um, sort of suggesting what the judge should do. Awesome! Nice round of applause for the last team. That's the last team. Is there anyone still standing? Question. Question. For the last team. Yes, for the last team. How would you make sure that the data is biased? How would you like know? 
because the pro it's the programmer he's making sure but what it, <laughs> but so like how would you make how would you enforce that the data is biased? You'd have to take out indicators of things like race, um, kind of say gender or anything like that. So as as well as taking out information directly like that, you'd have to make sure that your system wasn't also considering factors that directly predict your race or something, so that the machine is only making a decision on the factors that actually affect the case. Yeah, that's that's perfect explanation. I think I think ultimately is how do you make sure that the instance itself, you know, the, the things that it uses to optimize towards, you know, this racial bias, you can either um, remove it or modify it in a way that it doesn't affect it as much and this is through testing so running like you know an input of data testing it in you know not maybe not real life maybe real life or with actual different data to the training and see how it performs with specific bias so actually set test cases to see whether it is consistent or whether it, it's not but yeah that was really really good answer yeah sorry go on So, so I think, you know, I guess that is a good segue for lunch because you will have a lot of time to discuss on that. Okay, let, let's, uh, is that another question for the team? Or suggestion, okay. Yeah. Yeah, and I, th I think, you know, there, there is internal representations on the actual, um, you know, models that may find this and actually use it without you even putting that as an input. Um, so I think it's important to be careful with that. But yeah, so just to wrap up, um, that was really good exercise. You know, it's for you guys to just get thinking. I mean, ultimately, this should be more of like a lower level practical, you know, from a technical standpoint, what are the things that you should take into account when jumping into a project or the things that you should have in the back of your mind? You know, and ultimately, this should hopefully become, you know, com but almost unconscious. Um, so today we covered, you know, a brief, a brief recap on AI, ML, opportunities and risks, uh, ethics by design, and then, you know, the next steps, which were not just a workshop, but ensuring that you guys take this into a practical action. Um, you can find the uh, code um, in my GitHub. Uh, it's hosted as well as the slides are in my GitHub. So this is using Reveal.js. Um, and yeah, guys, so if you, think, if you need anything else, uh, you know, feel free to you know, reach out.